thank you to everyone for sticking with me and to the uh, hosts who are doing a great job. Unlike everyone else today, I will speak uh, not at all about immunotherapy. Um, that doesn't yet work here. So in the end, I'm gonna go over briefly in the Andrew Kovler one slide of how to treat pancreas cancer, cover everything. Um, and then we'll list the results of SLOG 1505 and SPEC 5F. Plus I'll cover a few other interesting things to watch out for. When you look at the treatment of pancreas cancer, despite the normal staging that exists, for most people, you can really, you break them up into clinically resectable disease, borderline resectable disease, locally advanced, which is unresectable, and then metastatic disease. The treatment for going up the slide for metastatic disease is standardly chemotherapy, and that's about it, with two main regimens of fulfirinox or gemcitabine napaclitaxel. I feel obligated to always point out that FDA approved uh, liposomal IRUTCAN with 5-FU is an appropriate second line option after a gemcitabine doublet, though most commonly apparently in the US people use uh, Fulfox or Fulfirinox. And then as the uh, a targeted agent or targeted-ish agent system, if you have a BRCA mutation, uh, PARP inhibitors for maintenance after something like GEMSYS or pot potentially fulfirinox is appropriate. Moving up, there's not really a whole lot of data for locally advanced disease, but we use the chemotherapy regimens that are for metastatic disease. Coming to borderline resectable, which I'll have actual abstracts to talk about and some data, the approach is usually neoadjuvant chemotherapy with or without radiation, followed by surgery and some more adjuvant chemotherapy. Typically, people have been using fulfirinox or gemcitabine napaclitaxel based off of the metastatic data. And then in the resectable setting, uh, surgery first approach is at the moment still standard, followed by adjuvant chemotherapy with or without radiation. Radiation based off of an abstract for a couple of years ago at ASCO shows the most benefit uh, in a retrospective study for those who are positive margined or node positive. Um, and then when you look at adjuvant chemotherapy, more drugs seems better as you add about 10% to your overall survival probably as you add one agent of chemo, two or you know, three chemotherapies. So looking first at a resectable disease, SWOG 1505 was presented at ASCO, which looked at perioperative chemotherapy with modified fulfirinox versus gemcitabine napaclitaxel. The background, um, which I'll repeat a few different times as we go through studies, is that resection and adjuvant chemotherapy achieves modest outcomes. Adjuvant chemotherapy is often limited secondary to the toxicities of the surgery and then side effects of chemotherapy that are worse after the surgery. And I think most people feel that pancreas cancer is a systemic disease for the majority of patients from the outset. So neoadjuvant treatment offers early control of systemic disease, gets more people chemotherapy, so it's improved delivery of chemotherapy. And if you get worse during uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, it's really a dropout of untoward physiology that likely shouldn't get surgery to begin with. So the key eligibility criteria in this study, which is somewhat important to pay attention to, is mostly the um, definition of resectable disease which is consistent with the NCCN, which had no interface with the uh, arterial supply and allowed less than 180 degrees interface with portal and the superior mesenteric veins. You then had to have a pain confluence so you could um, reconnect people if needed and then no lesion suspicious for metastatic disease, then typical things. So the study schema for SWOG 1505 was a randomization between 12 weeks of modified fulfirinox, the modification being the removal of the bolus 5-FU and standard gemcitabine napaclitaxel. Patients were then restaged. And if there was no progressive disease on restaging, patients went to surgery. And then afterwards, people received another 12 weeks of adjuvant therapy for a total of about six months of therapy. It's a randomized phase two study looking at a primary endpoint of two-year overall survival. 
The study was designed to pick the winner so it could then choose the arm that would be a perioperative versus adjuvant therapy study. So the first thing to do was to compare the two-year overall survival to historical controls of 40%. As we discussed, this is one of the only diseases where you get surgery and adjuvant therapy where this is um, this low. If the two-year overall survival was greater than or equal to 58%, the arms would then be compared. There was also a retrospective central radiology review of baseline scans for eligibility, and there was an interim analysis in this middle of it. So the total study enrolled 147 people. Uh, 43 were ineligible by central radiology and one person on pathology. In this, no, maybe for a study appropriate to remove those people for ineligibility, you know, if people were found to frankly have pancreas cancer, whether or not your radiology was able to see a primary mass or whether it was fully measurable. I, I don't really think these people necessarily should, should come out in clinical practice. And suspicion of metastatic disease will also be something which is, I'm gonna say in standard clinical practice gonna be more indeterminate uh, in, in actual clinical practice. These people probably shouldn't have been in the study um, for actual criteria of venous and arterial involvement. Uh, these numbers add up greater than, than 44 because there could be more than one reason that you are ineligible. But then in the end, for study purposes, we end up with these 102 people. So it's randomized. So there's a consort diagram where you can see that most people start successfully chemotherapy. Uh, less people complete the chemotherapy, but the vast majority do. Um, and then when you go to surgery, you can see you're starting to drop off by about 10 to 15% per step as we go down. So some of it was deterioration of people. Some of it was progression. Once again, these people not getting to surgery is probably not a bad thing. Unresectable in, in surgery and other reasons were reasonably low. Then after surgery, people don't get more chemotherapy because of either toxicity or progression which can happen even despite them getting this far or MD choice. And then not everyone finishes chemotherapy because as I said, the toxicity is more difficult. Uh, the irinotecan dose was in theory still the 180 milligrams per meter squared, which is not the modified fulfirinox adjuvant dose that is subsequently what we would use. So this is kind of reasonably typical of what you see in perioperative studies as fall off as you move forward. This is the adverse event table. I've added the highlights. I think the things that are important to show is that really uh, neutropenia is more difficult to manage with gemcitabine and napaclitaxel than it is with modified fulfirinox. As expected, diarrhea is worse when you're getting IRUTCAN. And then neuropathy is, um, as you get in the post-op setting, is getting to be more difficult as you get more oxaliplatinum, but is otherwise there for somewhat for everybody. Looking at the primary endpoint, you can see the target was 58% at two years. You can see in truth, neither of the arms hit that endpoint. Somewhat surprising to me, who's a big fan of modified fulfirinox, the median overall survival and the two-year overall survival was about the same for both of these arms. Looking at the results of surgery, the R0 resection rate was the same. The complete or major pathologic response was higher in truth for gemcitabine and paclitaxel. Looking at nodes and no negativity, it was about the same. In disease-free survival, not statistically different, but was um, numerically better for gem and paclitaxel despite the overall survival being the same. So the primary endpoint, and frankly, did not meet the pre-specified threshold for either arm perioperative modified fulfirinox and gemcitabine napaclitaxel appear to have similar efficacy with acceptable safety and resectability rates. It was rapidly accrued, though I didn't show that slide, showing the interest in preoperative chemotherapy. And for study purposes, central radiology review is likely gonna continue, though I think you could make it a little more clinically applicable to what people will undergo. So this is showing you the exact same slide I showed you earlier, and so far, nothing on this slide has changed. 
The next study that's presented at ASCO that's reasonably important to look at is SPAC5F, which is a forearm study, which I'll show you the details of that in an upcoming slide. The background is, is similar. This is a study looking at borderline resectable patients. Patients with borderline resectable pancreas cancer have poor survival and low resection rates. Neoadjuvant therapy, just like in the resectable study, may improve outcomes. And the main aim of this trial was to determine feasibility and then somewhat efficacy for comparison of immediate surgery versus neoadjuvant therapy. This study was a little bit older, so the regimens used in the 90 patients was either surgery first, gemcitabine, capecitabine, something that is used in the adjuvant setting for its positive study, fulfirinox, once again, technically modified to not have a bolus, or chemoradiotherapy with capecitabine. The primary outcome was recruitment rate and resection rate. The secondary outcomes were looking at R0 alone, toxicity, and overall survival, as presented here, plus some other things. The eligibility criteria is kind of reasonably standard stuff, plus borderline resectable mass, as defined by CT criteria. And now we have to slightly go to modified criteria compared to what sometimes people think about, which was for resectable, there's normal tissue planes. So there is some overlap of patients between this study and the SWOG 1505 study as any venous involvement um, was included in the study. So that would, include, would be borderline resectable. So there is some overlap in patients. It is reasonable criteria as, as mentioned though. So the surgeries people underwent was overall reasonably similar. Um, so maybe there's a slight pyloris preserving Whipple with um, people who had immediate surgery and fulfirinox, but the surgeries were reasonably the same. Interesting, there were people who had no surgery attempted for progression of disease in the immediate surgery group so the, there might have been a delay here, and that needs to be improved. And then progression was seen at least in fulfirinox, it seems, and maybe slightly higher in chemoradiotherapy in the gemcitabine, capecitabine arms. And then uh, one person died in those arms. The extent of the resection was, I would say, overall somewhat uh, similar between them. There's some number of differences here that are mostly of interest. Vein resection, uh, again, doesn't drastically seem all that different, though oddly higher in the chemoradiotherapy group. I only say oddly because chemoradiotherapy seemed the best at improving your R0 status. And as I'll show you on a subsequent slide, improving your no negativity. As far as getting adjuvant therapy in this arm, you can see compared to SLOT 1505 in truth, the vast majority of people did successfully get adjuvant therapy. It's unclear to me if there was a tumor downstaging effect. You can see T3 and T2 tumors for immediate surgery. For gemcitabine, capecitabine, maybe there's a slight switch downstaging. For fulfirinox, somehow we skip the PTT group and just go to uh, from T3 and T1s, but the biggest difference was the no negativity in the chemoradiotherapy group. So I felt like I had to show you the primary outcome of a recruitment rate, which comes to about 21 per year, but it was reasonable as people continue to find this of interest. So I took the next slide from the discussion section because I felt like it really put everything together regarding these outcomes. Uh, what you can see is that two months of neoadjuvant therapy was overall well tolerated and people were able to complete it. Progression or death for an immediate surgery group, you would think that should be, I would say, lower. Um, so how long from central review until people were able to move to, to the therapy? This number was a little bit surprising. As far as a resection rate of about 50 to 60 percent, this was consistent with retrospective data. It was a very high R1 resection rate, which is a little surprising and not yet explained. And as I said, no negativity was lowest for chemoradiotherapy. And what you'll see on this slide and then the next slide graphically is that for people who got immediate surgery versus neoadjuvant therapy, 12 month survival for neoadjuvant therapy 
was improved clearly in this setting. Splitting out this a little bit into which did the best, the Fulferinox group looks like they did numerically the best. Not that much better though than gemcitabine, capecitabine, and better than chemoradiotherapy. So the, the conclusions for this study is that there was really no statistically different in the resection rate, which is a primary outcome versus neoadjuvant therapy. There was a significant survival advantage, a secondary uh, endpoint at one year for neoadjuvant therapy compared with immediate surgery. Among the neoadjuvant treatments, Fulferinox demonstrated in this study the best survival at one year versus the other options. Toxicity with Fulferinox is higher, but clearly manageable. And neoadjuvant therapy should be considered for patients with borderline resectable pancreas cancer is their conclusion. So we continue to go with who goes first, surgery versus um, neoadjuvant therapies. And once again, this is just summarizing that there's a high R1 and node positivity rate and that people fail to get adjuvant therapy. So the goal, once again, is to have early and reliable delivery of systemic therapy to hopefully improve this, though it doesn't seem like neoadjuvant chemotherapy successfully improved this all that much. And once again, people getting neoadjuvant therapy who don't go to surgery, um, it's good of them, frankly, not to get surgery because they do poorly regardless. So sparing them operations is a good thing. When you look at the toxicity of, of the arms, the truth is, is the neoadjuvant therapy and the adjuvant therapy compared to what was seen in the adjuvant trials it's overall reasonably comparable. And I think we've all learned how to manage the toxicities in a good way. So in the end, I there, there are more questions than we have. Um, adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery is probably not removed yet from a standard of care, but perioperative chemotherapy is clearly a push, if not moving towards total neoadjuvant therapy. And future trials will need to continue to establish the best new adjuvant therapy regimen. And here, when you have a question of what's the benefit of radiotherapy, the Alliance trial not yet presented did close its radiation arm of SBRT. So what exactly the course and timing needs to be in the role of radiation remains to be seen. So the required elements for neoadjuvant therapy really include a uh, very good radiographic staging, which ideally you get a good CT scan, uh, a three-phase multi-phase CT scan of the pancreas before doing endoscopic procedures with can, which can change um, with some amount of inflammation what exactly you're seeing as far as venous involvement and things like that. You need good experienced radiologists. Ideally structured report templates will be coming and you need imaging performed close to therapy. So when patients are jaundiced, once again, ideally you get your appropriate multi-phase imaging beforehand, that's high quality, and then try and do your EUS and ERCP at the same time with a good uncovered metal stent placement. Aggressive supportive care is constantly needed for patients with pancreas cancer. So in summary, SPECT 5F dem demonstrated resection rates with upfront surgery and new adjuvant therapy to be equivalent. SWOG 1505 had equivalence of modified fulfirinox and gemcitabine napaclitaxel when given pre and post-op. I believe modified fulfirinox was the chosen arm to move forward into a future study. Neoadjuvant therapy um, probably should be the preferred treatment sequence for operable pancreas cancers though I'm not sure everyone's willing to do that yet. And future trials are gonna to have to define that and maybe further prove that. Moving into some other abstracts that were presented at ASCO, we do have an update for the APAC trials and SPAC4. These are different times, so you can't really compare from here to here, because as you can see, if you look at the gemcitabine arms, probably because of also eligibility in the two studies, they did drastically differently. 
But when you look at the APAC trial, which was gemcitabine, napaclitaxel versus gemcitabine in the adjuvant setting, mean overall survival and four-year overall survival, which I've note not the primary endpoint, uh, was a little bit improved. Similarly, when you had gemcitabine versus gemcitabine, capecitabine, these were also uh, somewhat improved and this was the primary endpoint. So this was a positive study. This was technically a negative study because it had its primary endpoint of disease-free survival with central review. I think it's important to mention uh, the hazard ratios for both of these studies was 0 0.8. And when you look at the cost for adjuvant gemcitabine apaclitaxel, it's about $78,000. And the adjuvant therapy in SPAC4 uh, for six cycles is about $1,170. So uh, napaclitaxel, which in truth I would say is harder to do than gemcape, is also much more expensive at this time. So if you need to double it, I think this is the preferred choice. That being said, modified fulfirinox has so far demonstrated the best overall survival data, uh, randomized meeting its endpoint. Another abstract presented at ASCO, I believe in a poster session or, not, or just as a poster, was a retrospective look at Naliri versus Fulfirinox. Being retrospective, you have the questions of, you know, why were different arms chosen? Was Fulfirinox given to people who were doing worse versus the needed a better response rate versus was Fulfirinox only able to be given to people who were in better shape? The conclusion of this uh, poster is that the efficacy and safety appears similar. So what to use in second line, um, I would say remains a little bit difficult to still tell you. Numerically, Fulfirinox here had a mean overall survival a little bit higher, progression-free survival a whopping month difference. The 12-month overall survival rates, in truth, you can see it was about 27% versus 40%. Um, the objective response rates were only a little bit higher disease control rate also. So it's a retrospective study with reasonable numbers. You can actually see that Fulfirinox was chosen greater than the other options when you looked back. So I think there's still maybe a little bit more preference to Fulfirinox in my mind. Um, and this could be further studied though it's in truth highly unlikely to get a whole lot of large focus at this time. So once again, I'm showing you the treatment of pancreas cancer in uh, one slide. And once again, nothing really has really changed, though maybe we could start saying resectable disease should get uh, perioperative therapy. So discussed in the developmental therapeutic study is a phase one study of 9-ING41, which is a small molecule inhibitor of glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta, a GSK3 beta inhibitor. Um, the study, as I'll show you, was a study in single agent and combined with chemotherapy in patients with refractory tumors. Um, this study is open here. They're on my disclosures, but the study was as presented at ASCO. So GSK is, is constitutionally active. There's increased expression and in aberrant function in numerous diseases, including cancer. It regulates NF-kappa B, promoting cancer cell survival and proliferation by facilitating, it seems, chemoresistance. It also manages uh, DNA damage repair and promotes various oncogenes. So this is the uh, first clinically relevant small molecule and potent selective GSK3 beta inhibitor. Uh, it inhibits GSK3 beta rapidly. It's an IV infusion that has to be given uh, once every or twice a week at this time. So that's its uh, somewhat a limiting factor. There is preclinical activity in pancreas cancer, both with arinutecan and gemcitabine. And there's not really expected uh, single agent activity. It really inhibits resistance to treatments. It also sensitizes pancreatic cancer cell lines to DNA damage when induced by gemcitabine. So this study had a part one looking at single agent. Part two, in patients who had progressed on this chemotherapy regimen that they were to receive, 
people were then given the same chemotherapy they had already progressed on with 9-ING-41. And then subsequently, it was chosen to move gemcitabine napaclitaxel forward in a two-stage design with, uh, as a first-line therapy being studied. Once again, this drug is given IV on days one and four. Uh, main study was looking at safety and you know, key eligibility, typical stuff. And in the part two was relapsed or refractory malignancy to the chemotherapy you got. This just shows you 116 patients got chemotherapy 9-ING-41 to things they were already refractory to. There was a lot of GI malignancies, plus some other ones. Adverse events. The main adverse effect is visual changes. And this is known to GSK3 beta inhibitors, which is how they see lights, brighter lights, or more intense, or darkening of some colors. Um, most of the time, this was resolved within hours, if not by the next day. Time of presentation, there were no grade three or four uh, SAEs. This is just showing you from the phase one parts of the pancreas cancer patients that people who had you know, very refractory disease were on durations of treatments that were hitting 45 weeks, 35 weeks, and looked promising um, to move forward to this part three first line study. So it was well tolerated without an actual MTD. Um, monotherapy, I didn't present it, was maybe in a melanoma patient. Lots of disease stability and enrollment continues to be ongoing. In the development of this agent, they have some pediatric and myofibrosis things. They also are working on an oral formulation to make this much easier to tolerate. So remembering that adjuvant trials are not comparable to neoadjuvant therapy. Same slide as I showed you as nothing's really changed based off of the data presented here. Aside of the fact that perioperative therapy will keep moving forward, um, people use almost any excuse to give perioperative therapy. And the, um, that study will eventually be done as we move forward, needing to develop novel therapeutics in this disease. Uh, that's the end of my talk. Almost on time overall for uh, for everyone here. Yeah, yeah. I think there's time now for some questions. Yes, thank you, Andrew. Uh, yes, we do have uh, some time for questions. So uh, let's see, there are a couple in the chat. So first is from uh, Bruce. Uh, he asked, did more patients receive GCSF support on the fulfirinox arm? And I think this was... Uh, yeah, regarding probably slide 1505, I didn't actually see data presented, which definitively told me um, how the GCSF support was given. To some extent, it's mentally easier to give, you know, a pegylated filgrastin just on disconnect, which commonly is done and improves the tolerability. So I'm unclear of how much was bolus removal versus probably just good, easy GCSF support. And then obviously with gemcitabine napaclitaxel, you can give GCSF but it's more difficult. And then, you know, you're fine on day eight and day 15, it's um, difficult. And if you actually look at the original gemcitabine napaclitaxel dosing, you know, they have a lot of various dose reductions that continue the chemotherapy, which I think practically people don't use. I think people just more often, you know, go to 80% and keep it there. So I don't have the exact GCSF data. So Nabeen Kirky asks, can you summarize the difference in use and evidence between gem napaclitaxel versus gem capsidabine? Yeah, so I think the important thing is, is you can't, so you have to look at, you know, you can't compare between the two studies because they had different eligibility criteria. You know, the APAC trial had normal CA-19-9s, uh, the, uh, the SPAC-4 study didn't, so there were potentially some metastatic patients. So different eligibility criteria, who had CT scans that were clean and things like that. So that was some of the difference. And then the APAC trial, the gem of Raxane or gem napaclitaxel adjuvant trial, it had a, a primary endpoint of disease-free survival by central radiology review, which it didn't meet. The gemcitabine, capecitabine study, SPAC4, met its overall survival 
uh, benefit. So, you know, to some extent you would say APAC could have been positive if they would have chosen a different endpoint and their overall survival and hazard ratio is the same as the SPAC-4 thing, SPAC-4 trial, I mean. But I think what's important to realize is that, you know, cost-wise and toxicity-wise, uh, gemcitabine and capecitabine is cheaper and easier to give. So I think that's the winner as far as it goes. Importantly, if you had someone who was having like 5-FU toxicity and unable to get fulfirinox and or capecitabine, gemcitabine or braxane is probably a better choice than, um, than, than just gemcitabine alone. Great. So Dr. Carolyn Wild asks, are you actually, are you usually using chemo radiation for borderline resectable patients? Yeah. So in the neoadjuvant setting, um, I'd say we debated a bunch at our institution and don't have a full standard between all of us. I, you know, if people get uh, a response to therapy, it's been shown that their, their outcomes of R0 resection is high. So first, if anyone has cancer that, you know, pancreas cancer that shrunk, we I usually just move them to surgery and then decide about chemo radiation in the adjuvant setting. If, if I give chemo radiation in a neoadjuvant setting, I'm more likely to use a short course of the treatment than like a five week course because I'm always concerned people progress during chemo radiation. I'm gonna combine this with the next question which is what are the current indications for post-op chemo radiation? Um, I think if you have an R1 resection, you definitely get it. Uh, if you're node positive, I send you to the radiation oncologist to have a conversation. In this retrospective abstract from a couple years ago that looked at um, National Cancer Database, the hazard ratio for no, uh, node positivity was uh, 0.9. If you had an R1 resection, it was also 0.9. If you had both, it was 0.8. So if you have a positive node in an R0 resection, I send you to discuss uh, to a radiation college to discuss the risks and benefits. Okay, I, I have a question regarding the, the investigational agent that you presented, the 9-ING. So, so those patients were refractory or resistant to uh, uh, the prior chemotherapy, but did these patients just come off that chemotherapy and continue it with the addition of this agent or was there generally a time lag between the two interventions, chemo and chemo plus this agent, which might have sensitized them again. Uh, and how, do, how, do the, how does the benefit in, let's say, you know, the successful patients compare to the experience with the prior trial of that chemotherapy? Yeah, so if, go, I'm gonna go look at the slide real quick. If there was, you know, if you looked at, there was a lot of therapies where people had gotten um, different things. So, so when you looked at the, um, the prior systemic therapies, the median for was, you know, two to three, though the range was one to 14. So it, it's not hundred percent clear to know, did you just get gemabraxane and then progress in the pancreas world versus, um, timeline? So, so I don't have all that specifics for, for, the, for the number of patients to know when they got it, um, if it was just done. You know, at our institution, uh, like in the sarcoma patients I took care of, they had actually, one person had got, just gotten the doxorubicin and one person had some inhibitors between them. So it's like any phase one study, right? These are people who are getting multiple lines of therapy and it's a little hard to tell what it is but it, it still looked reasonably promising. Pancreas cancer, you don't really get resensitized. So if either they had just progressed on it or whether they had gotten fulfirinox or some second line 5-FU based treatment and then continued with, then went back to it, that, that really rarely works in that disease at least. I, I, um, you know, just what, what's the best response rate that you see in the metastatic setting with any regimens? Uh that you use? In the metastatic setting? I mean, yeah. I, I in truth feel, I always feel like it's better than, than what it really is. Uh, the best response rates, you know, really are, pro 
in the studies are you know about 30 percent to um, the disease control rate can be higher the thing about pancreas cancer is you can clearly have uh, no in a neoadjuvant setting for example you can have a perfectly stable pancreatic mass in the primary and take it out and have a complete pathologic response. Mm. And there's a lot of fibrosis. So there's a lot to do with the stroma hanging around and cancer cells dying. So, um, you know, not having progression in a, in a neoadjuvant setting doesn't mean you didn't have a great response to therapy. You can have these tumors that have little cells in different parts that are spread apart. So they'll say the tumor was still five centimeters, though it was really cancer cell here, a cancer cell here and fibrosis between the two. So imaging clearly underrepresents uh, goodness in pancreas cancer. Bruce supported okay. the fact that we don't you, you routinely use chemo radiation in the neoadjuvant setting for borderline people, except ones with suboptimal response. Um, I agree. The, my difference would be if you have disease progression, I'm not really excited. I, I'm more excited to use the other chemotherapy than chemo radiation. Um, and I, I switch them up because I like to take people to uh, surgery who've had not progression, but, and I don't find chemo radiation greatly improves your response rate all that much. Um, um, it, it, so it's Bruce here. So I agree with that. We, we definitely do offer them more chemo. So sorry, I didn't expand on that. Um, but oftentimes we then might go on unless they have optimal response to another chemotherapy. Uh, you know, this, that's, those are probably the patients who might then get chemo radiation if they had exhausted all chemotherapy. 